chased our pleasures here and dug our treasures there But can you still recall the time we cried Bring on new to the other side Bring on new to the other side <laughs> Some of you are like, what in the world is going on? You'll see, it makes sense, right? What is the name of the sermon series? Good job. Okay, so we decided to bring one up on stage. Uh, this sermon series for Lent, we're looking at the gateways of the Bible. We're looking at uh, the Old Testament walking through over 180 times the imagery or the linguistic, the verbal use of doors are used throughout the Bible. One of the most kind of... Uh, pictures that is used by the writers of the, of the books of the Bible and used by Jesus. It's one of the most often. And so one of those things, our ears should perk up. We should be able to look at and study what these different doors are because these doors mean something. Last week we're in, we were at the ark, right? The door of the ark. And who remembers the very last part of the section that really we covered in uh, for a good amount of time? Does anyone remember what we read from the book of Genesis? The Lord close it. All right, that is in the New International Ron Zichterman version. Okay, uh, anyone else? Go ahead. Did, did you have it? And he shut them in. Right. We talked about the fact that G or that God was in control the entire time. That He is the one that uh, kind of told exactly to Noah how to build the ark. We we looked at a picture of the ark being in more in the belly of the door. That the Lord shut him in, shut them in, if you will, because Noah and his family was there because it was God that was doing it all. Right, And we talked about the gospel scene, right? like Jesus going on the cross, all of that, you know, that he was saving uh, those right in the covenant, saving those by his precious blood, much like the Lord saved Noah and his family before the flood and before the rest of the world was wiped away. And we looked at that door, that, th that door is a marker for us of God's provision, of God's salvation, God's plan from the very beginning. There was a plan. We go all the way back to the book of Genesis, and there's a plan there, right? There's a plan of salvation because of sin. And throughout the scriptures, we see doors being inside the door, being outside of the door. Uh, we're gonna, uh, it's going to culminate on Easter Sunday where Jesus calls himself the door, and so that is kind of that process where we're going. And so this morning, we're going to be in the book of Exodus. We're going to look at the Passover door. I was thinking about, should I wait and do this during Holy Week? That seems to make sense. But we don't really have a Good Friday service. We have a Monday, Thursday service here. And I wanted to go kind of in the, uh, in the flow of Scripture itself. Because we were in the Old Testament last week. We're going to remain in probably the most important door we're going to look at outside of Jesus, the narrow door on Easter, is this door, the Passover door. So we're going to jump into Exodus chapter 12. I have a helper this morning that is going to, uh, not only am I going to read it, but is going to be a visual, at least I think he is, somewhere. He's not ready yet. So the, the setup of this is obviously uh, the plagues in Egypt, right? This is where the Israelites are in, there it is, okay? So everyone say hi to Tozes. <laughs> Moses didn't have glasses, so that's why we have to change it. But this is, uh, this is Moses, uh, or Tozes, however you want to look, call him. And he's going to demonstrate for us as I read how the Passover door explanation came about, right? Because we're in the plagues in Egypt. The last plague, which was the plague of what? What was the last plague in Egypt? Angel of death, right? So it kind of puts coronavirus in perspective. And so, and so uh, we're going to talk about the Passover door and what that signifies. And so we're going to be in Exodus chapter 12, starting with verse 1. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, Every man shall take a lamb according to their father's house, a lamb for the household. And if the, if the household is too small for the lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take accordingly to the number of persons, according to which you, can, you, uh, you eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. 
and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of the Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Yet uh, anything remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you that on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you or destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt." This day shall be for you a memorial, and shall keep it, in, keep it as a feast to the Lord. That is a reading of Exodus chapter 12 of the Passover. So when I was preparing for this message, whenever I think about this, and I think I've even talked about it last Lent, I, re- I think of the, the movie Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston, right? How many of you have seen that one, the Charlton? I remember I was, I was little when we first watched it, and I remember, you know, if anyone remember the scene, right, uh, the Prince of Egypt did it in a magnificent way too, but the, the artistic quality of the Charlton Heston movie made a while ago, the angel of death was this eerie green, like, mist, right? And as it goes throughout the, the, the town, the Egypt and all that, you hear these screams, and it terrified me. It terrified me as a kid because it, it, I didn't really know a lot yet at all uh, about the story. We just kind of watched it out of just kind of tradition. Like, hey, it's Holy Week. We should watch the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston. And f- as a kid, it terrified me because of what this, the, the mist represented. It represented death. And if I sat down with each and every one of you this morning and I asked you what you were afraid of, I probably put 90% on the fact that probably the top three for all of us, or 90% of us, would be death. That death terrifies us. The idea of dying, the idea of, the idea of ceasing to be, the idea of no longer being on this earth, this idea of then passing into eternity, and that whole conversation, what happens when you die? What do you see a bright light? What do you see? You know, or do you all of a sudden look back at your life? All of those questions... For a lot of us, it terrifies us. I'm not going to ask for a raising of a hand for it, but I'm sure, I'm fairly confident that death scares most of us in some way, shape, or form. But I want you to go back and be, and in your mind, just be an Israelite for a second in Egypt. So now 500 years or so, your family, so your, your dad, your grandpa, your great-grandpa, your great-great-grandpa, all the way 500 years, so however many generations that is, right, have been slaves in Egypt. So the people on the scene, when this happened, being a slave was your life. You didn't know anything else. You didn't know a time when your family was free, because it goes back 500 years that you were a slave. That's the life you knew. You knew the Egyptians as your slave masters. You knew the building of temples, and you knew uh, the, the erecting of the pyramids. You knew all of those things. And then things start to change. You have quite the couple weeks. All of a sudden, this guy Moses shows up, which some of the people knew, right? Uh, Aaron and Miriam, they knew Moses. They were related to him. And so this guy that claims to be one of us, right? If we're an Israelite, he claims to be one of us. And that he's going to go and demand to Pharaoh that we all be set free. So try to get as best you can, because I have a question I want some of you to answer. All you know is slavery. What would be the thoughts you would have when you hear the word freedom? Hallelujah. Interesting. Okay. Hallelujah. Anyone else? Pipe dream. Absolutely. 
I don't know if that's a biblical term, but that's probably would definitely be a thought, right? A pipe dream. Whoever said pipe dream, why? Too good to be true, okay? So you have some skepticism. Absolutely. Others? Huh? Where should I? Okay, so we're going to get even logistical, right? Like, how's this going to work? Okay, anyone else? Can you give your husband a high five, please? Or, or an elbow bump. Yeah, you're married. And so, uh, a fear of being free. Isn't that an interesting take? All good answers, all definitely viable answers of probably how some of them felt. The fear of being free. So let's take Larry's thought and continue it on because it's actually, what that response is actually written in my message. The fear of being free and how did this all come about? It didn't, you know, Moses just didn't go to Pharaoh. They just didn't give each other a high five or a holy elbow and then they left. Pharaoh said no. And if you don't know the story, there were these plagues that happened, some awful plagues. And so if you have this mentality that, that the Israelite Larry have of a fear of being free, then all this other stuff starts to happen. Is that calming your fear or is that making your fear greater? It's probably making it greater, right? Because all of these natural disasters, if you're in they're not natural, God's doing them, are happening and you're experiencing them, yet you're still a slave. Freedom you have not yet tasted. Or, you, know, you haven't tasted it yet. All of these things are happening, and you're seeing it with your eye. You're experiencing it, and you go back to your family lure, right? Nothing like this has happened in the 500 years. Your families have been slaves there, but things start to happen. This fear comes. And there's a lot. If you go back to the book of Exodus, the whole beginning of the book of Exodus, you have all of these plagues. You know, God's promise of deliverance, and then you go into chapter 7, and the plagues start. The water turned into blood. The second plague, which is frogs. The third plague, which is gnats. The fourth plague, which is flies. Right? So a lot of these plagues are just really annoying. And so it's just all of these insects or animals all over the place. But then the fifth plague comes. Livestock, Egyptian livestock die. What's the key word there? Egyptian. So then all of a sudden, that fear that you may have, if we're all sharing it with Larry, the fear is there. You have all these frogs, you're, you have gnats, you have all of these things, but now things start to die. But it wasn't the Israelite livestock, though they probably didn't have much, right? They had some. They were allowed to have some of that under, Egy uh, under Egyptian law, but the Egyptian livestock start to die. Then all of a sudden, the sixth plague, boils start to break out. Read from chapter 9, verse 10. So they, uh, they took soot from their kiln and stood before Pharaoh, and Moses threw it in the air, and it became boils breaking out in sores on man and beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils. The magicians were not Israelites. The Egyptians were, or the, the magicians were Egyptians. Say that five times fast. And they stand before Moses because of, they could not stand before Moses because of the boils. For the boils came upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not listen to them. And the Lord had spoken to Moses. So now the Egyptians don't have their livestock. Now they have boils, which I'm not going to go too far into those because they're gross and painful. The seventh plague was hail. So now we're going back to some natural things, right? And weather, hail happens. The eighth plague, locusts happens. The ninth plague, darkness happens. So if I'm an Egyptian, right, I'm having a really bad couple weeks, Right? I have sores all over my body. I have bugs and frogs everywhere. It's now dark. My livestock are all dead. You know, really bad week or two or three, depending on the calendar you look at for this. But if you're an Israelite, you're seeing all of this. I mean, in the, the city of Egypt or in, in where that was, are you still afraid? Someone answer. Why? What? Yeah. So you're almost kind of like, when is the second shoe going to drop, right? You know, and I'm sure that skepticism is, you know, of 2020 is probably there still. 
And so that fear doesn't really go away. As much as God is showing his power and his might and, and, and that's being recognized as that. Why? Because Moses and Aaron is narrating this for the Israelites. He's giving them the color commentary of all of these things. Everything Moses that is, is saying is coming true. There's still fear. There's still fear. And then the final plague. Now, we read chapter 12. I'm going to pull a piece from chapter 11 to set up the door. The Lord said to Moses, this is the beginning of, of chapter 11, yet one plague more I will bring upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will, keep you, he will drive you away completely. Speak now in the hearing of the people that they ask every man of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor for silver and gold and jewelry. And the Lord gave the people favor in their sight of the Egyptians. Catch that. The Egyptians. So if you're an Egyptian, you're also seeing that nothing is happening to the, to the Israelites. So now, if you can, really quickly, jump into the mind of the Egyptians. How are you reacting to that? So if you're an Egyptian, and you're probably exhausted and hurt and pained and all that, how are you reacting to the fact that the Israelites, nothing's really happening to them? So if you're an Egyptian, what are some of the things going through your mind? Why won't Pharaoh let them leave? Interesting answer. Okay, others. You hate them more. Two very different responses. If you're an Egyptian, do you have fear? I bet you do. I mean, you got boils, you got insects, you got, you got darkness, you got, uh, you got dead animals, all of these things, and the, you're the slave owners. You're the top of the food chain, and the people below you, the slaves, they're not receiving all of this. And if I was an Egyptian, I'd wonder, where are my gods now? Because every one of the plagues, the Egyptians had a god or goddess for each of those. So they had a god for locusts. They had a god for light and dark. The ultimate god for them, Ra, right? They, what the Lord is doing, he is setting up against each and every one of Egypt's gods. And he is coming out the conqueror. So if I'm an, if I'm an Egyptian, am I starting to doubt my beliefs? I don't know. That's conjecture, even though most of this conversation is. But that's an interesting take. They both are coming to this last, this last um, plague in a fearful place. And the Egyptians didn't get told that this stuff was going to happen. So I've got to think, right, if I'm an Egyptian, I'm waking up going, what's going to happen today? So notice that the Lord is bringing both groups of people, right, because God is sovereign, Lord of all, every square inch, right? He's bringing both Groups of people to the same place. He's bringing them to this place of wondering, this place of fear, this place of the unknown. I don't know about any of you, but I know my life can tend to be like that. That sometimes I get driven to the place of an unknown. This place where I maybe not be comfortable in my own skin. I don't know what's going to happen. A place of anxiety and fear. And I know that there are people that share that with me this morning. Verse 4 of chapter 11, so Moses said, thus says the Lord, about midnight I will go out in the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on the throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmaid, and all firstborn of the cattle. There shall be a great cry throughout all of the land of Egypt, such as there never has been or ever will be again. But not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel, neither or either man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. And all your servants shall come down to me and bow down to me, saying, Get out, you and all your people get, uh, and who follow you. And after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in, the, in hot anger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. 
Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the people of Israel go out of the land. So now we come to the Passover. Now we come to, and notice in the beginning of what we read for the text this morning, this is starting anew for the Egyptian, or for the Israelites. The Lord said to Moses, this month shall be for you the beginning of the month, right? The same Hebrew word in the beginning, we see Moses write in the beginning of Genesis. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. This is the beginning, right? This is the new, the fresh start, if you will, for the Israel life. The plan is continuing. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day this month, every man shall take a lamb according to his father's house, a lamb for the household. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old. You may take it from the sheep or the goats, and on the 14th day, you shall kill the lambs at twilight. Then you shall put the blood on their door. So on the doorposts and the lentil, right? The doorposts, right? Uh, Home Depot doesn't really set, make them like they used to in, uh, in Egypt of this time. But, you know, the lentil is kind of on the top. The doorpost is here. And the lamb's blood goes on it. So let's pause. 15-second timeout. If you're an Israelite and you hear this now from Moses and Aaron, what are you thinking? This is what you're called to do. Take, very specific, right? Year old lamb without blemish, kill it, put the blood on your doorposts. We're not getting to the, the end part yet because that's coming. You've experienced the last couple weeks have been pretty, pretty intense, though you've been delivered in a lot of that. You don't have boils. All your livestock that you have is still alive, right? All of these things. But how are you engaging this? Anybody? I'm doing it, but I don't know, or what would you say, I'm doing it, I don't know what good it's going to do. Even though Moses and Aaron are telling you, right, because then he goes into that, you know, I will come through the land, right, firstborn are going to die, unless you have the blood on your doorposts and on your lentil. Notice the difference the other nine plagues, the Israelites did not have to do a thing. But for the tenth one, they did. Why? Obedience. A test of faith. Good answers. They have to take ownership. Interesting. Anyone else? Some of those kind of rub up against some of our Calvinism of God's sovereignty, right? Who are we to step into some of that, right? We have that friction, healthy tension. It's good. It teaches, right? It teaches us more about God. Anyone else? We're now being brought into what God is doing. And God just had a pretty crazy couple weeks as far as our, the way our, we, we've encountered it, the way our eyes have seen it. We're being brought into the narrative. But notice, I'm not going to center on the doorpost yet going to center on another piece. Uh, You shall let none of it remain until morning, talking about the lamb roasted, not boiled or eaten raw, right? Anything that remains until morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it. With your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. Why do you think God put that part of the command in there? Yeah, Tom. So, so really, you're setting up, you're going somewhere, right? This isn't, you know, put on your Thanksgiving pants. This isn't get all comfy. This isn't we're going to lounge around, right? God's still doing something. Something's going to happen. And I love what it says, right? You shall eat this and you shall eat it in haste. This is tying the gird up on your loins, right? This is getting ready to go. It is time. We're, this is the new thing for Israel. Israel will no longer be slaves. I am the Lord. So, you have this 
you know, Moses and Aaron telling the people of Israel, do it this way, do all of this, right? The blood shall be assigned to you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will will befall you or destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So you have, you have this conversation. Now it's all going to be completed. It's being laid out for all of us as Israelites. So, we do the blood, right? We, we have the year old, the lamb without blemish, right? That's a nod to the gospel. We'll get there in about six minutes. And so we do this, we follow, and then we go inside, right? It wasn't, you know, do that and then have a barbecue, right? It wasn't, do, it's going inside. Now, you are an Israelite family, you've done it, right? Your brothers or the dad of the house has done it. You've put the blood on the doorpost and the lentils, and now you're inside. Now what are you experiencing? What do you think you're feeling? Anybody? Anticipation. That's one feeling. Anyone else? I don't know if I'd be able to eat anything. <laughs> I'm kind of with you. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I'd be in the corner throwing up. Uh, anyone else? Still fear. So Larry's fear hasn't gone anywhere. It's still there. Anyone else? I'm looking for one specific... Don't roll your eyes. I do this often, right? I'm looking for one specific answer. See if anyone's on the wavelength with me. You're sitting there. The blood's on the doorpost. And notice a great cry is going to come out like there's never been and will never be again. This isn't a silent death. Right? This isn't all of a sudden just, boop, gone. Huh? You're keeping an eye on the firstborn. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, right here, yeah. Doubt. Why doubt? It's an excellent answer. Why doubt? Someone give her a high five. Three people give her a five. It's a biblical number. And so, I, so you're sitting there. You have fear Maybe you have confidence. I'm sure some of us may be there too, right? If I'm Moses, there's a part of me going, oh, I really hope this works, right? Like, I mean, there's some of that. If we're going to engage it honestly in our 2020 minds and our 2020 bodies, going back, looking, and we're engaging it, there's got to be doubt. There's got to be sitting there and wondering, right? Sitting there, and I think it's in the Prince of Egypt, they show uh, a family, uh, you know, I think it's a mother and a father huddled with their kids in the corner of the house, right? I think that's probably a good depiction of how they're feeling, fear and doubt. But in order to have faith, that's, some t- that's going to be tested, right? We just got through a whole book of First Peter talking about that, that as this is happening, the cries are coming out, if I, had a, if I had a picture of the map, I'd show you, right? It's not like they were all intertwined. It wasn't like one street was Egyptians, one street were Jews. The Jews were all kind of in the, in the slave quarters, right? The Israelites, I should say, were all in the slave quarters. But you notice the cries are coming from down the street. And cries like you've never heard before. Your family have been slaves for fifth or for five hundred years, right? They've been whipped, they've been beaten, they've probably been murdered and killed. All of these things, and we are caused, we are called by Moses to put our faith in this situation that God has a plan, that He's going to do it, and He's asking you to put the blood on the doorpost, and the Passover will happen. You have a meal. If you're me, you're throwing it back up. And if anyone's ever had the Seder meal, that's gross. And all of those things, right? And you're sitting there, the faith it must have taken, but also that friction, that battle that she talked about. That if I'm sitting there, I have faith and I have doubt and they're wrestling with one another. But all the while, in the back of our mind, God is in control. Now, some of these Israelites, they've blasphemed against God. Some, I'm sure, have left the faith, if you will, in that because they just can't stand, they can't live their lives as slaves, and they just, they want to give up. But then the Passover happens. Exodus 12, starting with verse 29. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, uh, who sat on his throne... To the foot, I love, I love how Moses put that. He's sitting on his throne as his firstborn is dead. Uh, to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon. 
and all the firstborn of the livestock. The livestock really took a hit over the last couple of weeks. And Pharaoh rose up in the middle of the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. Then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night and said, Up, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go serve the Lord you have said. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone, uh, and bless me also. That's a whole nother sermon series that I'm sure we'll get to. Bless me also. And then we get the exodus and then they leave. So if you're an Egyptian and you've just experienced the Passover, you have to remember a couple things. As I round third this morning, the what does this signify? What does the door signify about our lives? And how does it point towards the gospel? I want you to remember one thing about this. Remember this and allow it to wreck your week the way it wrecked mine. The Lord did not check inside who was worthy. He didn't go inside. He didn't go and interview the Israelites, the angel of death, and say, how long have you gone to church? How much money do you give in the offering plate? When did you make profession of faith? When did you do this? How Do you serve on committees? Do you do all of these things? How is your faith lived out? The angel did none of that. He did not go in and see who was qualified, who was not qualified. He did not go in and and hit a checklist. He did not go in and do an assessment. He did not go in and flip a coin. He did not go in and roll the dice. He did not go in at all. God checked the blood. He checked the blood on the doorposts. None of us, friends, are worthy. It's only through the blood of Of Jesus Christ. That's what we remember from the Passover. If you have any Jewish friends, that's what they take from the Passover story. The door, the angel of death. And at one point, all of us, unless we're brought to glory before then, will taste death. But on the Passover night, the Lord did not check the qualifications. He just saw the blood and he passed over. Those this morning that are in Christ, the blood of Jesus is over your life. The blood of Jesus is over every square inch of your life, and God, that's what God sees. It's not because you're good enough. It's not because you do enough. It's not because you say enough. It's not because you say the right things. It's because you've submitted your life to Jesus, and the blood of Christ covers you. The blood of Christ keeps you from God's wrath, keeps you from God's judgment. Like we saw last week with the door, right? We saw God as grace giver and God as ultimate judge. That during the story of the flood, people died. In the story of the Passover door, the peop- there are people that died. But God sustains those who claim him. That God sustains those who submit their lives to the Holy One, who submits their lives to the King. So if you are here this morning, and you don't know Jesus that way, you don't know Jesus as Lord, you, 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 maybe you're here as a skeptic, maybe you've been burned by the church, by a pastor, by a Christian, uh, by whatever, and you're skeptical about this life, you're skeptical about all of this, please ask that question. Who is, this that, who is this Jesus that saves? Who is this Jesus that does not look on the outward of all that you've done, will do, but looks at your heart? If you're here today and you have never confessed your sins, you've never claimed Jesus is Lord, please come see me after service. Come find someone on the band. Find one of the elders that are in the back, one of the deacons that took up the collection. Ask them that question. Who is this Jesus that saves? What is this blood all about? Why did he die? Because Jesus was the Passover lamb. Jesus was the lamb without blemish that was sacrificed for you and for me. That on the cross he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And when he said it is finished, like we prayed about, that relationship was restored So how does the Passover door point us to Christ? Because Jesus is the lamb for each and every one of us. That Jesus was the lamb without blemish, right? Jesus was the lamb that was slain, that you and I may have everlasting life. So when we get up there, and this is the gospel according to Jim, 
right? My sister who passed in August, I, I, I have this vision and I've had this dream and, and sometimes it feels more like a nightmare, but I, I engage it that when Lynn got up there and Lynn claimed Jesus as Lord of her life and she was standing before a holy and just God, Jesus came out, put his arm around her and said, Dad, she's with me. And into eternity she went. Friends, get this. There's nothing you can say or do. There's no notches on your belt checklist that you can live out that makes you good enough to get there. It is nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ that covers you. That's the gospel in this door, that Jesus' blood covers you. And if you don't know Jesus that way, please ask that question. It's the greatest question you're ever going to ask because the answer is life itself. As we learned from Peter, it's not life that's all rainbows and unicorns, right? It's not life that's all easy. There will be trials. They'll be stepping out in faith. They'll be doing all of these things. But there's also the perspective. We don't live for this world. We're going to do our best. We live as a people of grace, seeking forgiveness daily. At least I do. And we know that the best is yet to come because the blood of Jesus covers us. Let's pray. Father, to be an Israelite during that time would have been quite the the roller coaster. A lot of ups and downs. A lot of fear and even doubt. But Lord, you showed up in a powerful, powerful way. You showed up in a way that was life-changing. And God, it wasn't just a, you know, a story that we read of your goodness from long ago. It's a story we can read every day. That you continually show up because your blood covers us. It covers us from who we were from who we are and who we will be, that God in you is total salvation, in you is life and life abundant. So God, we thank you this morning for that, that you were the lamb that was slain, that we may have everlasting life. Father, we read that in the book of John, right? For you so loved the world that you gave your one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. May there be someone here this morning that doesn't know that. May they come to know that this morning. May they ask the person they elbow bump this morning at the greeting, God, who is this Jesus? Why do you follow him? What is this all about? And if not this morning, God, maybe it's that coworker. Maybe it's that neighbor. Maybe it's that one person that we've been praying about witnessing to and sharing the gospel with. And maybe it's just this this morning that pushes us over the edge to do that, to share that gospel. God, it's none of our doing. You've done the work. What you accomplish on the cross is life-changing. May we be a people that live that out. And our plans and what we're trying to do here as a church, may none of that get in the way of the mission you are driving through us to share the gospel, to save souls for Jesus. When it's all stripped down, may that remain, God. It is nothing but the blood of Jesus. May we live that daily anthem out, that others would see that and come to know you as Lord and Savior. So again, we say thank you, and we pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. If you'd stand, I'll give you the final blessing. We'll sing our closing song, and then there's a time of fellowship on my right and your left in the annex uh, to continue our elbow bumping and having cookies and coffee there. May the, the Lord bless you and keep you in this week. And remember, the blood of Jesus covers you. And as he blesses you and keeps you, may his face shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you to bring you peace, which always passes our understanding. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we all agree and said, amen.